Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good night, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm Nicolas Veron, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute, and it's my pleasure today to introduce this session uh, on FinTech and RecTech and SubTech and how technology is changing, not just the financial world in general, but specifically the business of financial oversight uh, with two stellar uh, speakers today. Uh, the first one is, uh, they're, they're, there are, as a cliche has, none of them needs introduction, but I'll, I'm still going to introduce them. Uh, the first speaker will be Benoit Curé, uh, who has, in the last few months has been heading the uh, innovation hub at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel since November last year. Uh, Benoit Curé uh, trained at, initially in the French system at Ecole Polytechnique, a graduate degree in economics at Ecole uh, des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. That actually makes him unusual for uh, French civil servants because most of them don't have a proper academic training in economics, but Benoit is the exception. And he also taught for many years at Ecole Polytechnique and then at Sciences Po. He spent much of his career at the French treasury from 1995 to 2011. He worked for years at the French Debt Management Office, uh, which he headed. Uh, he was there from 2002 to 2007. And then in the last two years and a half, 2009, 2011, he was Deputy Director General of the French Treasury. And after that, he moved on to Frankfurt as a European Central Bank, as member of the Executive Board, and was extremely uh, instrumental to all ECB initiatives under Mario Draghi with almost the same period as mandate, uh, 2011 to 2019, uh, as uh, I'm sure all of our attendees are familiar with. I should uh, add for transparency that I view Benoit as a personal friend. Uh, Professor Stanley Fisher uh, uh, is, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm humbled to introduce him because uh, everybody knows him better than I do. Uh, he studied at the London School of Economics and at MIT. He taught at the University of Chicago and MIT, and uh, ha then had many years of public service, but again, and in a way like Benoit, uh, on the basis of uh, an, a very um, recognized academic career. Uh, from 1988 to 90, he was at the World Bank, then he was at the IMF from 94 to 2001 as first deputy managing director. Uh, uh, Professor Fisher, as you know, is a dual citizen of Israel and uh, the United States. Uh, he then was governor at the Bank of Israel uh, from 2005 to 2013, and of course, vice chair of the Federal Reserve System uh, from 14 to 2017. He also has experience in the private sector. From 2002 to 2005, he was president of Citigroup International. And he has uh, many other uh, honors, affiliations, uh, duties, and responsibilities that I'm not going to mention, except, of course, one, which is that he's a member of the board of directors and the executive committee uh, of the board at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, for which uh, all of us in the team are extremely grateful. So that's enough for introduction. Uh, I uh, immediately give them the floor, and then we'll have, as usual, uh, an interactive conversation. Uh, Benoit. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for having me here. Um, and uh, particular thanks for uh, to Stan for uh, joining this conversation. I'm uh, both uh, looking forward and also also very humble to have uh, to have Stan um, commenting and uh, and uh, and uh, and being part of it. Uh, let me uh, let me share my presentation. Okay, do you have it, Nicola? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, um, what I want to do today is to uh, is to share a few thoughts about RecTech and SubTech and uh, and how it can uh, conceptually and also practically uh, improve the way uh, regulators and authorities are delivering on their on their duties on their mandates. Uh, also, building on some examples of what we do uh, in the in the innovation hub of the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, and I explain what the innovation hub is, uh, is about in a, in a second. Um, and, um, and the first slide is really about uh, reminding you that uh, we are in extraordinary times, just in case you would have forgotten. 
Um, and uh, what I want to say here is that um, COVID-19, uh, on top of being a, uh, a tremendous shock for the, for the global economy, uh, has prompted regulators and supervisors to, uh, to act uh, to mitigate uh, the impact uh, of the shock on the real economy. And that's not what we're discussing today, but it's an important part of the picture. But it, it has also been a change in the way uh, we work, as, as, we, as we can see today. Um, um, uh, without COVID-19, we would have been in a face-to-face -face, uh, conference uh, in, uh, in Washington, and we're not. Uh, and we've also seen COVID-19 uh, accelerating trends in uh, digital uh, innovation uh, in the real economy and also uh, in finance. And one, uh, I think, very well-known example now is, that is, is how current developments have uh, brought to the fore uh, digital payments. And you have an example of it uh, in the chart uh, on this uh, slide. Um, and uh, this change, this move towards digitalization also has underscored the importance of uh, resilient and accessible uh, central bank uh, architectures and, 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 and infrastructures um, that can support uh, this uh, move towards uh, digital finance and digital uh, payments. So in a sense, if there is a silver lining to this crisis is that in just three months, we've, uh, we've seen the power and the potential of uh, how technology can support and improve the way we work. Um, and central banks have a duty to be at the edge, uh, even at the cutting edge of this uh, technological change. Uh, and, um, and, that, and, and regulation and supervision are part of it. So that's what I want to discuss uh, today. So I want to say a word about high tech and, and sub tech. So uh, you, you can discuss the, the semantics of it. Uh, uh, so just as a convention, what I'm going to, the way I'm going to use these words today is uh, by uh, using rec tech to refer to the application of uh, financial technology, fintech, uh, for regulatory and compliance requirements and reporting by financial institutions, so in the, in the, in the industry, um, while I will be referring to sub tech um, as any application of fintech for regulatory, uh, supervisory, and oversight purpose, that is in the, in, the, in the official sector. You could use it in different ways, but it doesn't matter so much for today. Um, and um, the benefits and opportunities of both high tech and sub tech uh, are, are about improving the efficiency, about reducing manual processes, about uh, making effective use of data, and they are becoming to be, to be understood and, uh, and felt. Uh, and yet there are challenges, and I want to expand today on some of the challenges to, uh, to uh, moving to, uh, to, uh, to these technologies. Um, and I'm going to do it from my standpoint uh, at the uh, Innovation Hub uh, of the Bank for International, International Settlements, the BIS. So let me just say a brief word about the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, we've been established uh, uh, last year, 2019, uh, to spearhead uh, the response by central banks to uh, digital innovations. Um, we are doing, doing it in a practical way. That is, we're not a research center, we are a lab. We are building a portfolio of projects that, that are relevant to central bank activities across the world. Uh, we are currently doing it from three places, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Switzerland. So we have three centers, uh, all uh, led from Basel. Uh, and the BIS uh, board of directors decided uh, last month to expand our footprint to include new centers over the next couple of years in London, in Stockholm, with a group of Nordic central banks, in Toronto, uh, and in Frankfurt and Paris with the, uh, with the Euro system. So you, you can see on the map how we are kind of developing our footprint to be, uh, to be more representative of the, uh, of the global central banking community. Uh, and we're really, we're, it's really about building prototypes, building proof of concepts in a, uh, in a cloud environment that we are, that we, uh, that we are uh, uh, supporting. Uh, to, uh, to be delivered to the central banking community. Um, and that's, uh, that's from this uh, place that we want to, uh, to approach FinTech and, and SubTech and to be helpful. So um, in, in discussing the, uh, the benefits and challenges of SubTech and RegTech, um, let me start with an example that supervisors are quite familiar with, uh, uh, just as a simple way to start the conversation. Um, and which is, which, is, which is really about the day-to-day uh, the, uh, the -day supervisory remit. Um, so for most financial authorities, data management workflows uh, for many years have been heavily manual. Uh, data collection typically involves reports that are submitted in paper form or via email, which imposes uh, size file restrictions, uh, introduces uh, operational risk and security risk. And that's what you can see on the far left, uh, on the, on the, on the far left-hand side of this chart. 
and the, uh, the, uh, the, the rectech and subtech journey is about moving from the left hand of this chart to the, to the, to the right hand of this chart um, to try to overcome all these, uh, these costs and, uh, and, uh, and shortcomings. Um, so many authorities have already made significant progress in uh, automating uh, processes, which typically involves web-based portals or bulk uploads for uh, so the submission of uh, regulatory returns. Uh, and that's, that's moving to the, to the right side of the chart. Uh, but uh, I want to quote from one industry player who, who recently said in an interview that automating existing processes is, is an improvement, but isn't trans transformational. Uh, and I quote, in areas where the existing processes are not fully effective, we are basically just failing faster, which I think makes very well the point that it's not only about automation, it has to be, it has to be more than that. So now, if you if you if you if you if you do automation and if you couple it with uh, built-in automated validation checks, uh, if you uh, couple it with uh, dynamic data vis visualization uh, uh, to build uh, business dashboards, risk dashboards, if you add analytical processing uh, layers, then you can you can reach a deeper uh, diagnostic analysis, uh, and you can you can have better insights. So if you imagine a world where big data architecture is built with technology uh, stacks uh, that support data of, of higher granularity and higher frequency uh, and, and, and more diversity, uh, then you're moving really to the far hand side of the, of the chart. You can fully automate data loading and uh, consolidation uh, using APIs, uh, application programming interfaces. Uh, you can have larger data pools, uh, more data storage, uh, greater computing power, and then add uh, layers of statistical modeling and predictive analytics, uh, and, and then you're just doing your work better. Uh, so with the addition of artificial intelligence solutions or tools, uh, you, you take automation one step further. One example of it, which is now being used to some extent by some supervisors is uh, natural language processing to, um, to make sense of all the data that you can scrape on the web um, uh, to match and merge uh, dis disparate da data sets to, uh, to, uh, to drive parts of data management and to better inform your action. So that's not science fiction, the technology is there. Some supervisors are doing part of it. The question is how do you move fully to the, uh, to the far hand chart uh, of, this, of this chart? And there are, challenges. there are challenges, there are challenges. So I want to spend some time on that slide, which is really the most important in my uh, introduction, which is about the challenges. Uh, and there are different challenges. Uh, for digital transformation. So um, first, it's, uh, when, you, when you look at the surveys about the implementation of, uh, of RecTech and SubTech, you can see that uh, there has been some progress, but uh, we are not, uh, we're not yet there. Uh, to give an example, there was a survey last year by the uh, Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, CCAF, and the World Bank, which found that uh, among uh, 111 jurisdictions, only 38 had innovation initiatives such as innovation officers or regulatory sandboxes. Um, only 14% of regulators uh, surveyed had uh, high tech and sub tech programs in operations. And I could go on and on. So you see that we are, we are just at the beginning of the learning curve here. Uh, and why is that so? Because, because of the challenges. So um, there are different types of challenges. Uh, some of them have to do with technology itself and some of them go beyond technology. Um, and, and let me say, by the way, that, that uh, some challenges are common to supervisors and, or, and to banks or, or, or to the industry alike. Uh, and they, uh, they, go to, they speak to the heart of technological innovation in finance. Uh, so they're not necessarily specific to the supervisory business. Uh, they are just about uh, technological innovation uh, in finance. So starting with the technology, um, we, all, we all remember uh, how after the great financial crisis, uh, the, um, the complexity uh, and, um, and opacity of internal models uh, had to be addressed. Uh, it had enabled some banks to game the system. Um, and we realized uh, in, a, in a hard way that both banks and uh, banks and bank boards and even bank supervisors had little understanding of the risk parameters uh, being used, uh, which contributed in that case uh, to an excessive degree of, uh, of risk, risk weighted asset variation. Um, and there are similarities with the current debate on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, there is this black box element in decision making, which sounds very familiar. 
and it may be difficult for human users in financial institutions and for regulators to grasp uh, how, how outputs and decisions generated by AI and generated by machine learning tools uh, have been formulated and how they can be explained. It's, it's a big black box and both uh, banks and uh, su bank supervisors uh, are struggling. Um, and it may be no coincidence that banks are increasingly interested in uh, using AI and machine learning tools to uh, increase the efficiency, accuracy, and speed of capital optimization. So that's even something that supervis supervisors may not like because that could be used by banks to, uh, I wouldn't say gamble, I wouldn't say uh, game, but let's say to optimize their, their capital needs in a way supervisors don't like. Um, and so the lack of transparency and also the complexity uh, is, a, is an issue here. And that is not well addressed uh, by uh, current regulatory and supervisory frameworks. Um, prudential authorities in many places don't have a remit for firms which are not banks. Some services uh, previously conducted by banks are now being provided by other firms that may not be regulated by bank supervisors. So what I'm saying here is that fintech related changes may require regulators and supervisors to, to leave their comfort zone and reassess their supervisory models and resources, and uh, also to reach out to non-financial uh, supervisors, to reach, to reach out to telecom regulators, to reach out to privacy authorities, um, also to learn from the discussions, uh, say in the justice field, there are rich discussions on the use and maybe the abuse of pred predictive justice, which, which financial regulators could learn from, and they're not doing it that much. Some other challenges, and I'm going to be quick now, some other challenges are not entirely about technology. You, one big challenge, very well known from, from, the, from the industry and from supervisors is about the, the talent pool. It's about HR management, high demand for data scientists and for engineers, higher than supply, continuing to grow. Also because there are all, all other drivers for demand, like, like cyber resilience, obviously. So for, for supervisory authorities competing with the private sector to attract these talents is proves very difficult. Resource planning, training, engaging with technology firms uh, should be a focus of supervisors. Um, and there are deeper cultural challenges which have to do with the fact that digital transformation requires a certain degree of uncertainty, uh, a certain degree of experimentation and a, a mindset that allows you to, to fail uh, and to fail fast which is not the mindset in supervision and which is not the mindset in the central banking community. <clears throat> I can see it clearly from my position today at the BIS Innovation Hub, which is a laboratory uh, nested in a uh, very respectable 90 year old uh, cooperative of central banks. And you can see a tension between uh, risk aversion, conservatism and, uh, and innovation. Uh, and we have to find ways to, to surmount it. So um, let, let me be positive and conclude in a positive way. So how do we overcome the challenges? We overcome the challenges through collaboration. So that's something that is being done uh, in the industry with many financial institutions reporting that collaboration and uh, building an ecosystem of uh, alliances, partnerships with fintechs uh, is key to, to the success of, uh, of financial transformation generally and, and to regtech in particular. Um, and that also implies collaboration between regulatory authorities, financial institutions, and uh, external technology experts. And let me give you two examples, and that will be my conclusion. Two examples of, uh, of initiatives that we've been launching at the, at the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, the first initiative I would like to, uh, to showcase here is the TechSprint initiative that we've launched uh, with the, um, well, in Singapore, with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, um, uh, based on the uh, so-called APIX platform, which has been developed by the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the ASEAN uh, Financial Innovation Network, which is an open architecture API uh, marketplace and a sandbox. And we've been using this sandbox uh, in a competition, the TechSprint competition, uh, to um, uh, provide solutions to ask fintech firms around the world to provide solutions to uh, questions asked by G20 regulators, and it's a partnership with the Saudi presidency of the G20. And very recently, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we've uh, announced that we've shortlisted 20 uh, uh, fintech firms out of 128 uh, um, applications uh, coming from 35 countries. Uh, and that, uh, that ranges a range of, um, um, uh, of, uh, of sub subtech applications. Um, uh, that, uh, that can be useful to G20 supervisors and regulators. 
so after summer uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll announce the, the winners uh, with the uh, with the Saudi presidency of the G20. Um, and the second uh, examples I wanted to to mention here is uh, in a very different field. Um, it's about uh, supervisory challenges uh, uh, raised by, by fastly changing technology. Uh, and that's a project that we have in the Swiss center of the BIS Innovation Hub uh, to build a, a cloud-based real-time uh, market monitoring platform that will monitor uh, as the FX markets in real time, based not only on prices and volumes, but also order books and a number of other variables to, uh, to do uh, real-time analytics of the, uh, of the changing uh, structure of, uh, of FX markets using a streaming platform. Uh, and so stream processing the real-time flow coming from FX markets. Um, and that's something that will help central banks cope with the, the fastly changing nature of technology uh, in these uh, in these fast-paced uh, markets. Um, we'll focus initially on, on the FX market, but then we can expand it to other markets um, as uh, as uh, as needed or as suggested by regulators. So I uh, I'm closing here. Um, so uh, that is the supervisor of the future. Um, Question is how do we how do we move from um, from the current uh, uh, techniques of regulations and, and supervision to the, to the supervision of the future using these technologies? And my what I wanted to argue today is that uh, there is a lot of learning, also, of course, by individual supervisors and individual supervisory authorities. But collaboration is key. That's about collaboration between supervisors, which is what we're doing here in the innovation hub. But that's also about collaboration between supervisors and the industry, um, also uh, based on um, on open platforms and sandboxes, which uh, allow to test tech tech and sub tech uh, uh, um, uh, solutions. So I've been much too long, uh, Nicola. I apologize for that, and I hand it over to you. Back You've to you. Been too long, but that was superb. Even so, I'm a bit intimidated by the supervisor of the future uh, image at the end. Uh, you need to unshare your screen, Benoit, so that uh, we get the presentation from Professor Fisher. Uh, I should add something I should have said at the beginning, which is a personal disclosure that uh, I feel uh, duty bound to make that I'm also an independent uh, board member at the trade repository arm of TTCC, which provides data to uh, supervisors on uh, um, derivatives markets and other things. It's a nonprofit operation, but a commercial one. Um, and uh, with this, uh, over to you, Professor Fisher. We don't hear you. Sorry. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, especially in my own home. And uh, the question is, uh, what's uh, what's different now? And the, the obvious things are the sorts of things people tell you. I uh, sent money to Google uh, yesterday and uh, got the interest back on it today and so forth. And uh, everybody is very impressed by all these things that are happening. So the speed of, at which the system works is much great, greater. Uh, than uh, anything else. Um, if you have a mobile phone and if you have access to the internet, uh, you're uh, way ahead in terms of what we were like 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And uh, big data and machine learning, uh, well, we know a lot about that, but I'm not going to talk about it because this will come in at the end. And all this will lead to an improved, we hope, infrastructure of the uh, industry, uh, of the financial uh, industry. I'm going to talk quickly about the regulatory mission of uh, the regulators, and I'll do it just by mentioning headlines. Um, stability is the, remains the most important thing that regulators have to uh, ensure and maintain. And uh, on, uh, in that uh, slide there, you'll see a variety of things that can either improve stability or uh, interrupt stability. And we've got to deal with all those uh, things. 
we also have to worry enormously about consumer protection. Um, it's critical and there's nothing that will uh, destroy the uh, advance of, of, uh, of new technologies uh, if they don't work. So we've got to get that straight. Um, and we want to ensure competition. And competition has to be maintained. Uh, it's very easy to uh, build, uh, build uh, monopolistic uh, structures inside a, a very new field. And the regulators have to be on top of that and make sure it doesn't happen. So the overall uh, regulatory mission is also uh, summed up by saying regulatory arbitrage is bound to be an attraction and uh, it will have to be very carefully watched and very carefully maintained and will be the regulators basically mainly who have to decide how to prevent uh, arbitrage uh, taking, uh, taking place. So the story is we have the same goals as we've always had, uh, but there are new challenges because of the uh, speed with which things uh, get uh, done. So let's go now and look at the regulatory challenge. Speed and agility is what's it is the benefit of that we get out of all this. You need to have technological know-how. Where do you need to have it? You need to have on the side of the users of the technology and on the side of the supervisors uh, of the technology. And for both of those, uh, it's a challenge and it's an important challenge. We've just got to keep people learning. Uh, is a particular problem with uh, black boxes, with algorithmic black boxes, where in essence you're given a black box and you're told it works. And then if you're the regulator, you've got to make sure that it actually does work. And uh, if you're the uh, user, you've also got to figure out some way of knowing that it works as ever. Um, we have, uh, talking about arbitrage already, we have to make sure that we don't have people shopping for uh, jurisdictional and regulatory uh, places to um, provide for their own uh, for their own uh, use and profit. And so we've got to watch that and supervise that and make sure it isn't uh, the main game that's being played in the new models, but in the new world. But there will be some of that and we've got to watch it very, very carefully uh, indeed. And there are also cross-market influences, which we've got to deal with. And there are massive amounts of data. And if you've been following the use, say, in economics of, of uh, people who are now uh, getting access to uh, all the, uh, all the uh, uh, regulatory, all the, sorry, say, tax, uh, tax returns of the entire country, which happens in, in some uh, papers. Uh, you've got enormous challenge to make that thing work and to get the results of that. Regulators are supposed to do well, then what we've been talking about, basically how much of this has been developing, and uh, it says sandboxes sound very exciting. You can read, read your notes about playing the sandbox. Uh, and no action letters or uh, randomized control trials uh, developed. From, uh, how to integrate regulatively uh, from the transaction. 
And now to a theme that I think anybody who's watching this and asking how it's working, uh, we have to get the quality of uh, technology, knowledge of technology on both sides uh, increased, but particularly since we're talking about regulatory uh, toolkit, uh, it's uh, got to be done uh, by the regulators. And uh, finally, technology, reg tech, which is uh, what uh, regulators uh, do. And uh, sorry, uh, reg tech is what happens in the private sector. And soup tech is what happens in the supervisory uh, sector. And that is a lot of uh, challenge for the people who are running the regulatory uh, system. You also are getting developments of improvements in, uh, in regulation through industry interactions, that is round tables, which are frequently between producers and regulators. Uh, you also have think tanks, which may or may not involve uh, regulators, as well as uh, the thinkers of, in the tanks. Um, Cross-border cooperation, well, we've certainly seen that in what uh, Wen Wai has shown us. And it's very important in having sat in on uh, several meetings of the uh, uh, Bank for International Settlements in Basel. Uh, that can work very well in an organization which has already got itself uh, set up. Uh, to uh, encourage interaction between uh, different nations. And we also know from the living in our countries that uh, cooperation among different regulators uh, within a country is uh, important and uh, sometimes difficult. Um, but not everything has to be regulated. There is open banking and uh, it's developing. Uh, will it uh, be a wave of the future? Well, probably not, but I'm sure they said that about automobiles and things like that when they started. They don't anymore. And there's also uh, B2B access to infrastructure and to services. So that's, uh, I hope, somewhere close to 10 minutes. Uh, this is immensely interesting, immensely exciting. And the question is, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the key to success? And the key to success is for the regulators to be like the, uh, like the industry itself. Speed and agility is critical. The ability to use big data and soup, uh, and soup tech integration is, is critical and specialization and cooperation are both elements that need to be developed and that will be developed, comma, we hope. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, this is uh, the end of uh, my presentation and I really uh, value being on a session with Benoit and his colleagues as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fisher. And uh, I think we have a number of um, very thought-provoking questions from both presentations now. So let me uh, follow on on this. Uh, let me start with a first question from myself, and then I'll take questions from you, the Nicholas, can I put up my hand? Um, I've got another appointment, I understand. And uh, I can't stay on for uh, the second part, although Oh, um, well, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get yes. to then. Uh, but thanks so much for having been with us uh, so far and for the, the great presentation. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And Benoit, great to see you. And uh, just as soon as the planes are moving again, I look forward to meeting you again. Thanks. Very Thank you much. very much, Stan. Thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. Um, Benoit, then, uh, uh, my question is about. Uh, what we already observe in this field of subtech, uh, obviously a lot of it is moving fast and a lot of it is uh, ahead in the future. 
would you say there are already achievements? You had the slide with four arrows, uh, you know, uh, is there any uh, case study that you would say gets us uh, to the third or even the fourth arrow in terms of existing supervisory pr practices as opposed to ongoing projects? Well, as, as I said, it's a, um, it's, a, uh, it's a transformation, so it's a journey. So uh, the, uh, the direction and speed is, uh, is, in a sense, as important as, the, as, as where we are standing point in time because it's moving fast. So it's really, it's really significant that, uh, that uh, most supervisors have started you know, engaging and investing and hiring uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to be on this journey, to participate in this journey. Uh, so far, uh, and I may be contradicted by, by some participants today or, or colleagues later, what, what I've seen is a lot of automation, as I said, which is the first step in the journey. And it's important because it, 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 can, it has the potential to, to cut costs and it's, it's in any, any way the necessary basis. It's foundational, right? If it's not automated, you're not going to go anywhere. So uh, that's, what, uh, that's what people have been doing. And then you've got a few um, kind of focused applications. Uh, a lot of them are based on natural language processing. For instance, you have some supervisors uh, using uh, natural language uh, analysis to uh, process, uh, to do um, uh, consumer protection um, enforcement in, in financial services. For instance, to process questions asked by the, by the public or, or, or complaints by, by, uh, by, uh, by consumers and, and users. Using, uh, uh, using automated processes. Uh, also a lot of web scraping, for instance, when you do fit and proper and you want to know more about individuals, you go all across the web and then you use uh, web scraping automation to, uh, to, uh, to collect what's available, right? It's not or a game changer. To, to check the, the fitness and properness of banking exactly. directors, right? It, exactly. It's not a game changer also because, and I think that that's the essence of the discussion is what do we need to uh, change the game also in terms of change in the regulation itself? Because it's one thing to uh, kind of automate and in increase productivity to enforce regulation as it stands today. But of course, the next question that is coming very fast is, in so far, do you need to change regulation to, uh, to, to go further? So for instance, do you want to have access to real-time data from banks, which today supervisors don't do, right? And is that useful? And it's not for me to answer. I'm not a bank supervisor. It, it might not be. It might not be so useful. A lot of it is, is anyway. Account, uh, I mean, accounting. You know, uh, 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 stand, uh, accounting concepts which you can't you can't produce in real time. But uh, it it uh, it's uh, and we have a counter example which you know very well, Nicola, because you've been candid about your <laughs> about your your uh, your interests, uh, which is the example of trade repository data, right? Uh, we've uh, we've done it the other way around. We first changed regulation to ask um, to ask uh, 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 swap platforms to uh, to uh, to produce real time data and send it to supervisors, and then we found out that we couldn't do much with it because we didn't have the technology on the supervisory side. So so the going the other way around doesn't necessarily work, right? Uh, and we've got to learn from our from from our mistakes. Obviously, I'm not going to make any comments here on behalf of DTCC, which I uh, I'm not, uh, with, which which would not be uh, fit and proper for me to do um, in any case. I'm only an independent director here. Um, I have a, a question of clarification, um, uh, which was asked by uh, uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, what do you mean by open banking? Well, open ban op op open banking is a uh, is a, um, is a framework where banks can have access to, uh, to client data in an open way. So uh, that's, I mean, I, I come from a European background, as you, as, you, as you know, so that's what we have in, our, in uh, for instance, in, uh, in PSD2 for payment you know, service providers, that uh, you have uh, client customer data in so, in so far as it's authorized by the client themselves, obviously. Um, the clients have control of their data, but if they authorize it, the data, is pushed on a on an API, and then any uh, any uh, payment service provider can use it. So that's that's an example of open payments in that case, right? So you have common infrastructures, and then uh, you have uh, competition and uh, open entry uh, on the on the on the platform into the architecture uh, you, to use click client data, and the technology underlying it is essentially about APIs. 
I have a number of questions which uh, I think are related to effects of scale. Uh, and let me ask them in a kind of bundle. Um, one is whether this, um, the development of subtech uh, and rec tech, by the way, uh, how will it differentially aff affect players of different size? Is it an advantage for the incumbents because they have you know, big ca uh, capital reserves, infrastructure experience, and they can implement regulation quickly, which would kind of join with the literature that says that more regulation generally favors big incumbents, also because they have reg uh, relationships with the regulators that allow them to understand what is really being asked of them. Uh, or is it uh, kind of on the, on, by contrast, going to favor new entrants because they're more nimble, they're more adaptive, they don't have legacy systems and things like that. How do you, how do you think about this on the, on the side of supervised uh, or regulated entities? And then I'll ask a similar question on the side of supervisors themselves. No, I think it's both. I think you are right on, on both accounts. That is, uh, RegTech will, will, will favor large incumbents uh, because they can pay the fixed cost of investing in all these technologies and is going to favor um, new entrants um, uh, if, they are, if they are new and if they are nimble enough. And it's going to be bad for, uh, uh, for um, large um, uh, existing players uh, who don't have the resources to, uh, to invest in technology. So uh, it's not that much in terms of big versus small. It's more in terms of who's going, who's able to pay the cost. Uh, and uh, when you kind of compound this discussion with uh, what you see in terms of differences in profitability and the cost basis across, across uh, regions, uh, for instance, just to give you an obvious example, that's something that can favor uh, US banks over European banks because on average, and I'm not, I'm not, of course, I'm not commenting on any specific case, but on average, um, uh, European banks are less profitable, have a higher cost base, and uh, they will uh, they will struggle to uh, to invest in all these new technologies. So that's something that can increase the divide. It has the potential to increase the divide. What about uh, emerging versus uh, developed economies? I mean, is this a, a rich country development, or how do you look at that divide? No, I don't. I don't. I don't really. I don't think so because it's a. Uh, I mean, don't forget that a lot of it is, is customer driven, right? Uh, because you can you can automate customer data uh, only uh, in so far as your your customer processes are automated, right? Uh, that is, you need to go digital also uh, at the front end of your market and in payments, etc. And we've seen lots of emerging markets and developing economies doing that. Uh, so. Um, in so far as emerging market economies and some developing economies are already at the, at the leading edge of digitalization, uh, they will go faster uh, uh, leveraging, leveraging rec tech and implementing rec tech solutions. So uh, it can, yeah. That's, that's kind of the, the, the general almost abstract argument. Do you see that in practice? Do you see uh, that in, uh, from your perch, you can see a lot of you know, best and bad practices. Uh, does your observation match that? Uh, kind of yes. general. Framing. I can, and again, I'm not giving name or, or names or examples, but I can see, I can generally see Asia, Asia be, being more advanced than, than Europe when it comes to uh, when when it comes to rec tech. So that I guess answers the question. And the US, well, West, uh, North America. Well, in the US, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not a specialist of the US market, and then there is there's obviously a lot of diversity. So you see, you see uh, large uh, international US banks moving fast, and then you have smaller banks which are more, uh, which have a more domestic reach. So I think there is quite a lot of diversity there. So let's move to subtech and the impact on authorities. Um, there's a very uh, a question which I. Uh, maybe unsurprisingly find fascinating, which is asked by Frederick Diestet of uh, the uh, Swedish Treasury. Does the successful use of subtech require larger supervisory authorities because of the need for resources? Uh, or could, on the, by contrast, larger organizations tackle innovative solutions? Uh, for example, does the ECB, the SSM, have an advantage compared to national uh, competent authorities in this respect in, uh, in a framework like the Eurozone? Yeah, I think they do. I think they do um, because, again, because of the fixed cost, right? So uh, you've got quite a lot of investment both in technologies and in, uh, in, uh, in skills, even maybe even more importantly. Um, and so you need to reach a critical mass to do that. 
Uh, which is why I suggested in my remarks that you need different kind of kind of integration, right? You need some kind of uh, horizontal integration or, or let's say horizontal cooperation with your peers to be able to share the, fisc the fixed cost. And that's why to, to answer your question, I think the SSM is in a better place than any individual uh, European supervisor, but you could do it differently. You could, you could develop joint uh, platforms uh, uh, research with, with, uh, between the supervisor and the central bank when the supervisor is not the central bank or between the bank supervisor and the market authority. So there are different ways to cooperate there. And you also need vertical cooperation, vertical integration that is cooperating with the market, with the industry to test solutions, to, uh, to test new approaches on uh, uh, protected, uh, uh, in protected spaces, in sandboxes or, or dedicated platforms, uh, because that's not something that you can do in a test tube, right? So you need both kinds of, uh, of cooperation, horizontal and vertical. Sorry, um, I had to mute uh, for background noise. Uh, the, the, would you, do you think this will spur the development of uh, more cooperation among authorities from different jurisdictions in terms of you know, uh, sharing costs and sharing resources for project development, not necessarily at the global level at the BIS, but you know, in, in regional groups or things like that? Yeah, I think it can. I mean, that's, that's basically what I do at the BIS. That's my, my day job at the BIS is exactly doing that. Uh, uh, that is developing solutions on behalf of a community of, of uh, central banks, who many of them happening to be also supervisors. Um, it could be done at a regional level and it doesn't have to be a shared uh, platform. It, it's also about exchanging uh, experiences, uh, ex ex uh, comparing solutions, etc. cetera. So we'll, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll see a lot of cooperation and we need, we need to see that for the reasons uh, Stan Fisher uh, raised uh, early on in his comments, that is, uh, there is a lot of uh, regulatory arbitrage going on. Regulatory arbitrage is, uh, is the, the, the flip side of regulation. It's always there, right? Um, and, uh, and there will be regulatory arbitrage also in that field. And so you need, uh, you need a common approach to, uh, to, um, uh, to the, um, to the a common approach to rec tech by supervisors and maybe common principle for sub tech. And the, the Financial Stability Board is very active and they are, they are working on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a survey and a paper on the use of subtech and rec tech and its consequences for financial stability. So uh, it's very good to see that the financial stability is, uh, is, uh, is also leading that discussion and will be leading, leading that discussion. On, on this issue of tech enabled uh, regulatory arbitrage and this was a question that is asked uh, by Alexander Svoboda, um, what do we already see that? Uh, can you give examples of tech-enabled uh, regulatory arbitrage, which is already happening and uh, being, uh, you know, addressed or not by uh, authorities? No, I can't. I can't. I can't give an example, but uh, I, I would. I would. I would assume that it's a that it's a risk. It's a very tangible risk um, that. Uh, uh, banks can use technology can be faster than the than the, than the supervisor, right? Um, and um, and you could even have a, a kind of uh, a kind of um, two way uh, two way game between uh, between banks and supervisors. That is, once supervisors have embraced uh, subtech using, for instance, particular methods and algorithms, if banks know the algorithms, they will try to game the algorithm. Just like if you know the, the way the stress test will be done, you will try to optimize your stress test, which is, which, is, which is human nature, right? And so if you know the way the, the supervisor will, uh, will, uh, will run, uh, if, if you know the kind of machine learning algorithm that the, the supervisor will run on your activities to know more about what you're doing, uh, there will be a temptation to, uh, to, uh, to game it as well. Uh, so, so we're going to see that game, uh, and uh, which is why it's so important for supervisors to stay ahead of the game, right? and to invest in the right technologies and resources. But I guess there is a widespread perception that at least compared to with big tech, if not to banks, supervisors are behind in the game almost by uh, definition, right? Because the, 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 tech, the, the cutting edge technologies are developed by tech companies and it's not the job of uh, supervisors to develop them. So I have a question here by Georg Ringe. Uh, how likely is subtech likely to be, be subject to regulatory capture, for example, through the choice of technology or the technological design? Because the industry is much, the tech industry is much further advanced in uh, developing those solutions that regulators can do. 
Yeah, well, well, it, I think it's not, it's not, uh, it, I think it's a risk which is not specific to to technology, right? I mean, there is always a risk of regulatory capture, capture, and the the most sophisticated your technology, your your the most the, the more sophisticated your your supervision or your 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 regulation, the more the risk that uh, you will be uh, you will be captured by the industry, and that with that what we've seen before the great financial crisis, right? Uh, uh, with uh, uh, in particular with. Uh, uh, with uh, with model based uh, uh, capital requirements, right? So there is a risk to see a new form of that. That is uh, regulation becoming increasingly sophisticated, and banks running ahead of the game and uh, keeping the supervisor captured, which would be exactly a replay of what we've seen uh, up and until 2008. And we need to avoid that. On the other hand, you don't want to regu your regulation to be too simplistic, right? So it's a, it's a trade off. You need to you just need to be in the right place. Uh, there is no simple solution. I guess if I understood Georg's uh, question right, and maybe I misunderstood it, there is a specific risk which is different if uh, big tech firms enter the financial space, which apart from China has not really uh, happened yet. Because then it's, it's a bit like if you were you know, paying the rent to a bank, right? I mean, the, the, the same firms would be regulated entities and your, serv your critical service provider. So, so that would be uh, certainly a different situation from the ones we had even in the run up to the great financial crisis, no? Yeah, that's for sure, Nicola, but uh, aren't we already in that situation? So uh, we, we should already be acting on it. That is, we already have a, a very limited number of uh, key critical service providers at the global level that are providing services both to uh, the industry and to supervisors. Let's say, I mean, cloud services is, is an obvious example. And so you have, uh, which raises first a, uh, a competition issue, obviously. Second, a, uh, a, a possibly a financial stability issue because you have new nodes of uh, transmission uh, of shocks uh, uh, which stand outside of the financial sector. We, we, and we used to think about the financial sector as a network, right? With nodes transmitting shocks. And now some of these key nodes are outside of the, of the, of the financial sector and are not even being regulated by, uh, by financial supervisors. And it also creates a risk of capture. I agree with that, but uh, I would argue that we're already there and we already should be thinking about it. Well, but if, you, if we follow you and, uh, and, and you've been provocative in that last uh, response, so let me uh, ask uh, uh, another provocation uh, as a follow-up. Uh, what you basically said is that technology companies such as cloud service providers are critically important for financial stability. They are. I believe they so, are. And if so, then the question uh, of their regulation by financial stability authorities uh, comes very fast. And then the next question is, don't we have a huge supervisory gap here? We, we do have a, I wouldn't say we have a supervisory gap. It, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be supervised by financial uh, uh, supervisors, but certainly there should be a dialogue between financial uh, supervisors and uh, and tech supervisors and competition authorities and that dialogue is developing very fast. So I'm not I'm not fundamentally pessimistic about the future. I mean we see that dialogue coming, but uh, uh, it's only developing now. I have a question from Francis Gross on uh, technology neutrality. I mean, is there such a thing as technology neutral regulation uh, in this new world? Uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I guess it, it, it very much echoes the previous point about financial uh, stability, right? Because he said tech has the potential to produce large scale harm very fast and not non measurable. <clears throat> That's so, so it's, it's, it's a... how does the embracing of technology, uh, how, how should the embrace of technology be, be channeled or regulated from the perspective of no. financial? A bit in a very holistic way. It's a it's 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 a very good point, but it's also very theoretical. That is, I mean, the regulation is about regulating actual activities, actual technologies. So uh, I, I, any regulator would like to start from first principles, being uh, similar activities with similar risks should be regulated in a similar way. That's what we're all saying. And of course, it's much more difficult to do than to say, because when you're uh, you're in real life, you're confronted with a particular technology, a particular firm and particular clients, right? So it's an aspiration, right? That is when you, uh, and that's, that's really for me, what the, what the FSB should be, uh, should be striving at achieving that when they address FinTech and RecTech and SubTech, 
they should keep that first principle of uh, uh, similar uh, risk and similar activities being regulated the same way as a um, as a uh, as a principle to guide any further any future supervision. Um, now it can only be a principle because, as I said, in real life you're confronted with, with specific technologies. So of course the FSB is the Financial Stability Board, and that's a separate entity from the BIS, but uh, located in the same place. And I guess uh, uh, if only because of the synergies they use you as a resource as well, right? Um, not really. I mean, we are we, we they are located in the same uh, in the same uh, building, but the F, what the the, F, the FSB uh, the FSB's line of business is uh, regulation and is financial stability, mm -hmm. and uh, what we do is really uh, producing technology for uh, the central bank community. So we, we exchange a lot, but uh, we are not in the same line of business. Uh, I have a question of, uh, from Stephen Cecchetti, uh, also familiar in Basel, who, is a, uh, who asked the follow-up to your point about um, model and banks trying to game the model. And that, uh, so he, I, I'll read his question. What you describe is an arms race uh, within the, with the industry, always trying to anticipate and blunder supervisors. Will someone build a regulatory and supervisory counterintelligence operation whereas the official sector anticipates how the industry will react to their actions and act in a way that uh, it, it uh, makes elicit the desired private sector response. Is the BIS or someone else building such a counterintelligence capacity? Yeah, that's, a, uh, that's, that's very smart and, uh, and, and typical of Steve, uh, because it is very smart. Now, uh, it's tempting. Now, um, using an analogy coming from my previous job as a central banker, as a, as a monetary policy maker, you have the same kind of discussion when you do monetary policy, right? So that you want, you know that markets will react to what you say and you want to talk in a way that uh, will, uh, will steer market in a particular way that, is, that fits your, your monetary policy intentions, right? Uh, it's a, uh, I mean, Ben Bernanke famously uh, talked about the, uh, the hall of mirrors, right? Uh, of monetary policy. So you could have a technological hall of mirrors uh, where um, um, where the industry will try to anticipate the way supervisors will an analyze using automated processes, machine learning, and the like, uh, what they say, and and they will try to uh, they will try to uh, to front run supervisors and vice versa. Um, but sometimes it doesn't it doesn't pay to be too smart, right? In, also in monetary policy. So um, I would also that's a personal really a personal take here. But I would I would also envisage and, uh, and maybe expect that at some point supervisors will want to, uh, to, uh, to keep things simple and and avoid becoming too sophisticated because that's a game they may not win, right? They may lose to, they may always lose to the market. So at some point I would expect some kind of pushback and, they, and, and swing back towards uh, 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 trying to keep regulation simple uh, because that's something you can master as a supervisor and also that's something the public understands. I mean, if you do, if you regulate a bank based on uh, uh, based on AI, and if you make a big blunder, how are you going to explain your parliament what happened? Are you going to explain the algorithm to the parliament? So sometimes it pays to keep things simple because you're mandated by by citizens and you want to be able to uh, to uh, to uh, you to come back you, to citizens. You, you're accountable to citizens. You think that keeping things simple will still be an option in an age of AI, big data, and technology? <clears throat> Well, you know what, in extreme cases, you always have the option just to not, not, not let things happen. So there, may, there might be things that are just so complicated and so difficult to master that as a supervisor, uh, as a risk adverse supervisor, you just, want, you just don't want it to happen at all. And that's a little bit the conclusion we came to in uh, after 2007, right? That some products were just so complicated that uh, you probably would have uh, preferred not to let them happen in the first place. So we, in some cases, we might come to the same kind of conclusions. I have a last question. Unfortunately, many, many great questions that we won't have time to address, but the, but the last one by an anonymous attendee is, BIS committees have a long history of cooperation and collaboration. Are any of these committees well equipped to collaborate on reg and subtech, or do these topics re require a new collaborative structure? Of course, your hub is, uh, is the part answer to that question, but it's, it's uh, uh, just a lab, as you said. Uh, so, on the core missions of the committees, do you see a need for new architectures? No, I don't. I don't. I mean, two two things. First, all, all committees are catching up very fast. So, the, the BCBS, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the CPMI uh, Committee on Markets and 
uh, and, and payments and market infrastructure, they're all catching up very fast when it comes to technology and they're discussing it. Um, now what you need, and, and I, I can, my, my, my colleagues and I can help them, you know, understand some of the, of the technologies underlying the discussions. That, that's our, our, our remit in that discussion. Uh, but on top of that, what, what you really need is interaction, cooperation, dialogue with non-financial supervisors. I think that's of the essence and it's only starting. And on that note, uh, we'll have to end the session for uh, time discipline, but uh, I hope we'll have other conversations with you, Benoit, with your colleagues at the Innovation Hub at the Bank for International Settlements, uh, and more generally uh, in the uh, framework of this series, Financial Statements, uh, at the Peterson Institute. Thanks very much to all for uh, active participation. Thanks particularly to Benoit and in absence to uh, Stan Fisher for uh, their engagement. And uh, I will, uh, we'll meet again on September 2nd, we'll talk about uh, uh, capital markets versus banks in terms of how to think about financial stability, uh, also in the context of COVID with Barbara Novick from BlackRock and uh, Jeremy Stein. Uh, so we'll, uh, I look forward to uh, seeing many of you again at that occasion. Uh, thanks very much and have a good, very good rest of the day. Thanks again, particularly to you, Benoit.